And so, you know, I, I understand the title of your your podcast. I don't believe it, but I understand it. <laughs> because I love it. Be, That's good. Be, because this conversation is exactly what you want church to be. Western Christianity has spent the last 2,000 years telling everyone they're separated from God. This is not church with John and Nat Turney. Hey, everybody out there, welcome again to another episode of This Is Not Church, a podcast where my brother John and I like to delve into those things that uh, the church tends to shy away from and the church tends to try and and sometimes uh, bury a little bit, the questions that burn in our minds. And so as we are wont to do, uh, we've reached out to some some friends and some people that we look up to and that we respect. And today we have the awesome privilege of talking to both Dr. Brad Jersak and William Paul Young. Um, can I call you Paul? Is that all right? Please. Or, <laughs> yeah, no, the William thing was a was sort of an add-on at the beginning because I'm one of four generations of Williams, none of who go by William. Right, right. And that, uh, I'll tell you something about that. I got a friend. I got a friend who does something similar. But uh, anyway, I don't want to. I'm already off track. See what we've done. Um, so Brad. Is, and anyway, he's a doctor too. Is so he a doctor saying. too? Did I did I leave out the doctor part? Oh my goodness. Yeah. Well, that's okay. That was honorary, so I didn't actually. So earn I can it. go back and say the honorary <laughs> doctor William Paul Young. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sir. Honorary yeah. means he did <laughs> earn it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's true. There we go. Yeah, yes. I never, I I just uh, yeah no I had to drop I had to drop my pants at graduation to get that thing. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's a story. Oh. Well, Brad Brad comes to us um, out of academia. He's a he's a scholar's scholar, as I like to say. He's just a brilliant guy, author of uh, twenty plus books. His children's books, by the way, are so cool. Don't bypass those if you're a grown up and go, well, that's a kid's book. No, it's phenomenal. All good kids' books are adult books. They're just, you know, they're sneaky and incognito, but they're all to train adults in how to be parents. There yeah. we go. And then we have uh, we have Paul here, who is the author of probably, I think, one of the finest pieces of religious literature in the last hundred years, man. And I know I'm, I sounds like I'm blowing smoke, but... Um, the shack has done more, I think, to renovate and restore the image of God in the world, or at least the way that we have perceived him um, or her, than maybe anything else that's been written. And I, just, I love it. And Thank you. I, Who'd have thought? <laughs> Who'd have thought? Aren't the best things like that always that you write them yeah. for yourself or out of your own personal experiences? And then if you if you hit upon something universal, then it resonates. And uh it's beautiful. I'll tell you one thing before we jump into The Pastor, which is y'all's new book that you co-wrote, but I do like to give a little personal testimony sometimes. I've already told Brad how much uh, how much his book has meant to me. A More Christ-Like God was revolutionary as a watershed thing for me. I resisted reading The Shack for a long time, and not out of any kind of religiosity or weirdness. Um, my problem was I had young girls, and the second that my wife, who was already diving into it and loving every second of it, um, that little piece of the storyline of the shack slip. And I said, nope, not happening. I can't read that. Fast forward a few years and actually ended up not reading the book, but listening to it on a, on audio on a, on a road trip. We had a long road trip and it nearly caused me to crash my car a couple of times. The deers were just too, they were just thick and they were coming. And so I just wanted to thank you because you're a, you're an integral part of, of this trajectory that my, my life has taken where I've began to see God is the loving, accepting, inclusive creator rather than the distant deity that I had been raised to believe and grown up and, and fearing rather than loving. So I thank you for that. And I'm sure there, everybody else who is listening would probably have similar accounts, but welcome. As you were saying that, I palpably felt the arm of Papa God just come around from behind me and looking over my shoulders and going like, that's that's my boy right there. That's, <laughs> that's, that's awesome. my boy. Wow, that is so that's, that's so good. So yeah, let's let's talk about the pastor. And I have I have a few questions, like I said, but I'm sure as we discussed that we would we would probably meander somewhat from whatever formula we had planned. So, but a real a real a real quick question: just what's the what's the impetus? What's the thought process behind? writing something like this? Uh, well, Paul, when, Paul and I have talked about this before, and a, a lot of it is demonstrating in a fiction format true stories of people we know 
to teach us that there is no one who's unhealable or irredeemable. I think we've distilled it to that and, and, uh, you know, that we would hope is the takeaway. And I mentioned that, you know, true stories in the sense that uh, really good fiction is always true, but this also gives voice to people we know who could not share their testimony in other ways. And so that we felt gave it some authenticity to that. So when you're listening or, or we, and we really advocate the, the audio book, it's, yes. it's theater of the mind. It's a multicast voice. And I'm telling you, those people brought it. They, I mean, they, they embedded their emotional worlds into those characters because they could identify in one sense or another. But the characters in the book are, are composite characters, all of them. You know, I, I can find myself in a bunch of them, but, but, but composite, as Brad was saying, of, of real people we know. Some of the dialogue is right out of text messages or emails or conversations. And, it, and it's their voices that are emerging inside these characters. And I think that's part of the power of it. How much of yourself do you see in this, in either of you or both of you, how much of yourselves do you see um, in this character, this main protagonist of the pastor? Too much, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, I mean, the main thing would be our stories are quite different than his in terms of the details sure. of his crash. <laughs> but but the overall story arch, Paul and I have both, both experienced that move from, uh, from self-will and pride uh, through the valley of the shadow of death and hell. Right. Uh, where we bottomed out and then found found that grace was waiting for us mm. at the bottom rather than, you know, us digging our way out of the holes we found ourselves in. And so, the, and, and I would suggest that story arc is the human journey. Sure. I would also suggest that it, it wasn't so, I don't think, and Bradley, you can, you can check this. I don't think it was pride. I think it was shame posturing as pride. Mm. I'd go with that. Yeah, yeah. for sure. For yeah. sure. Because, you know, when, when you really believe you're a piece of crap, pr pride is not a problem, but you still have to present yourself as being worthy. <laughs> wow. E even though you don't believe it at all. And so that's the power of shame. Bradley? Yeah, that's, uh, I would go with that too. And you can see that in the pastor at the beginning of this book, that his fundamentalism was very abrasive and, and and finger wagging, but really that that's that's a coping mechanism for the shame below the the both wounds of that he's inflicted on others and that he's self inflicted. And so then, how do you how do you deal with that? And uh, Archbishop Lazar, he always told me, you know, that uh, moral outrage is a form of confession for mm. deeply repressed repressed hurts and passions. And so. You know, when the finger is pointing outwards, you can just ask yourself, like, okay, wh who is it inside that I'm so despising that I have to turn this outwards on others? I just think, just think about the culture we're in and how much finger wagging there is right now. And, and if you understand what Bishop Lazar is saying, you'll begin to realize that we are in a cosmic confessional right now. Yeah. Right. Wow. And, and then you don't have to. You don't have to be defending yourself in an antagonistic sense. You can actually be the, the presence of the confessor, you know, the, the one who listens to the, the harm and the hurt. But uh, so, so many of us, we don't have a sense of the truth of who we are anyway. And so we, we become finger waggers and, and, you know, join the confessional in that sense rather than be the ones who listen. It seems like we, you know, like you're saying, we have this this shame built in with us, and then we have this mentality of uh, like fake it till you make it, right? So you put on this fake pride, this fake persona that you are in control, that you that you have it all together, but deep inside you know you're a piece of shit, and so the easiest thing to do is to point at other people and point at, and 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 show them where they are wrong and how and how they're messed up. That even I, where I relate to that now, let's say um, as a younger, <laughs> as a as a child fundamentalist, I would hear, 
I would hear the revivalists come through a little town and, you know, they'd be pointing the finger at the loose women, which was a confession of their own Mm -hmm. lust and all of that. But now in terms of me as a, um, as an 50 some, (laughs) um, I've come through a process where I've had to deal with my outrage towards fundamentalism. Mm. And I'm like, wait a minute, what, what's with this? What's with the vitriol that comes out of my heart towards them? And, and what that led me to was to see how I bore shame for being duped by that, for being complicit in it, and even for preaching that way. And as I face that shame, a wonderful thing has happened. And that is, I've been able to retrieve the very best of my childhood. And to see wow, how my parents so good, Bradley. It, it's just amazing. Like I can't even think about, you know, I grew I grew up in that kind of dispensationalist, hellfire revivalist preaching, but I don't get triggered by that anymore because what I'm what I'm feeling, having faced my shame and laid it down, is that now what I remember most strongly is the prayers of my mother and the name of Jesus that was precious to me from the time she told it to me on my lap and the way my father would pour through the scriptures and share good news with people. Even when he had the hellfire motivation in the background, he wasn't putting that on others. It was about God loves you and amazing grace. And, and I'm like, okay, now, so I've retrieved that. And, and, but why did, how did the bitterness leave? It, it left because I took my own shame, but I, I followed my outrage to my shame and that's where I got it. Wow. Here's one of the beautiful things about who our enemies are, right? Because you're supposed to love your enemies, but why would you do that? And one thing is that you begin to recognize them as gifts because anybody that can push your buttons is, is allowing the crap to surface to the, to the top so that there's a possibility of healing. In other words, they're uncovering that vitriol that needs to be lanced. And there's nobody like our quote unquote enemies that will do that for us. Our friends don't tend to do that to us. So whoever pushes your buttons are the, are truly gifts in your life. And uh, which gives a different, for me, it gives a different way of, of saying, all right, who are my enemies and, and, and why do I love them? And it's like, oh my gosh, look, they continue to bring to the surface the crap that needs to be dealt with that's, that's still hidden in the, in the broken recesses of my own heart. Yeah. I find, I find it really interesting that both the book, The Shack, and The Pastor of Crisis seem to be dealing with the issue of shame, but seemingly from sort of different, coming at it from different directions. So we look at Mac and The Shack, and we, we see that, that, that there's, there are these things that had happened to him. He's the victim in so many of these cases, and obviously he has his own baggage and stuff. And then contrasting that with The Pastor, we see that although he's been the victim, he's turned into a victimizer as well. And so we're being asked to then, the hardest part about the pastor, by the way, I think that anyone's going to deal with is being asked to show some level of compassion towards a person who has committed atrocities and and actually want to see his well-being, see yeah. him restored somewhat, see him brought around. And, and so much of our sense of justice is he needs to get what's coming to him. You know, if that was a true crime novel, you know, his victim would show up at the end and, and unload on him, you know, and, and justice would be served. But what we have here is where, you know, you've done a masterful job in a short book, by the way, of actually garnering some sympathy for a guy who's not very sympathetic in a lot of ways. And I, I wonder if you talk about that. If I'm, I'm, I'm sure that was intentional, but what was your, what's your thought processes behind all that? Bradley, tell the story of our friend, our runner. Oh, yeah. So um, I have a friend uh, who we have a number of friends who struggle with eating disorders. This particular one is a runner. And so she will punish herself um, by by doing a marathon run if she eats two cookies, that kind of thing. Wow. Right? And so I guess she had uh, got the audio book and was on one of these punishment marathons. I mean, a literal marathon, probably halfway through the marathon listening and it comes to the end of the book and then texts us halfway through and, and just says, you know, through sobbing probably <laughs> that at, she said, well, the struggle with her and the revelation to her was that at first she hated the pastor because he had been like people who she knew. 
and and then the second stage was she be, she found herself involuntarily i guess or by by grace loving the pastor so moving from hatred to love and and then it dawned on her um if i could love the pastor maybe i could love me and and that was like a major revelation to her because uh, no one has been more abusive to her than herself you know and the kind of self harm that comes with with shame and um and and to to see her get that was just it's worth it's worth writing the book for us. Absolutely. Um, just for, you know, people like that who get back to us and say, you know, I got halfway through the book. I had to stop. I gave it a second try and I popped through to the, to the grace side of it. And that we're finding that common. So if there's a folks who are like, they, they just got to lay it down. That's okay. But I all would also say, give it 20 more minutes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. You know, and, and see, see, what grace does, but that, I guess it, it is, it's not gratuitous at, we didn't believe it's gratuitous. No, the, I don't, I don't in, think so in, either. But in, in, in terms of, uh, of the, uh, adult kind of reading side of it, neither Paul or I can handle a faith that can't handle that. Yes. If it's not, right. if it's not gospel, to, to perpetrators and victims of perpetrators, then, then is it robust enough? So we had to really push it. The trigger warning is not to keep people away. It is just to say, actually, it's an invitation. I think another just really good idea on your part was to, I mean, and obviously it was your decision to do, but uh, writing it in a fiction form uh, let gives you the, uh, the access or the ability to step one step back. You know, if this is a true story or if this is a memoir, there's a, there's a real, there's a real person in the back of your mind. You're thinking about that person that specific is like, well, this is about somebody, but as a fiction, a story of fiction, you get to step back, you know, just a little bit and you can, you can accept it in another level that I don't think a, a true story would, would allow for you to do. That is, and you're so right. That's the power, part of the power of fiction. Anyway, go ahead. I, I did. I, I have listened to it now twice, and I first of all have to agree with both of you 100. percent You sh- you need to listen to the aud- the audible uh, version of this. There, I've read it, and then I've heard it, and some of the pe- the some of the lines in the book are um, maybe I glossed over or maybe didn't recognize, but the the power behind the voice is really just bring you along on the journey. But in the, between the listening, between the first listening and the second listening, I was talking to Nat about this, actually. I read uh, Between Noon and Three. I was telling him, I was like, I, I see some similarities. And the, the biggest similarity that I see between these two books is you guys have taken something that's just atrocious and you've shown grace in it. You've taken something that we should not, uh, society says we should not forgive. And you show grace, redemption, forgiveness through all of that and, and from that. So what are your thoughts on how that, how that kind of came to be? Well, one of the things I, I've discovered is that societies, whatever society is, I suppose that that's uh, the world that is unwilling to forgive and actually thinks that grace is naive is absolutely naive itself. It, it has not dealt with these issues at all. And for example, I just got a text this morning from one of the from one of the men who's part of the composite characters. And here's a guy who who uh, uh, went to prison uh, for having molested someone who was underage. Did his full term there? There, there you go. Society got its pound of flesh, and he would say he did say to me. Uh, I can tell you this, when Jesus said it, says it would have been better for a millstone to be hung around my neck and drop me in the sea, he was absolutely right. This is <laughs> what he went through in terms of his own shame, brokenness, seeing the harm he had done, and then what he went through in prison as a as a predator. Um, millstone, is, millstone would have been merciful, right? And so he comes out of that. He wasn't healed. He wasn't rehabilitated whatsoever by the punishment. Yes, he needed to be separated from the general population for a time. He would agree. I would agree. But, but to think that 
punitive or penal justice is going to do any work to rehabilitate him was is utterly naive plus his those who are victims zero healing for them in fact even it became worse in this sense uh, i've experienced this a lot where someone will think i will be healed if my offender is punished and then they're not and how disillusioning and that and now he's out in the population again and he's got to work his way through oh my goodness so so the naivety of unforgiveness and grace a graceless approach um is astounding to me it's like how's that working for you but then to see what god has done in his, this guy's life and some of some of his healing come is part of our narrative and to see the turnaround and to see him become a man of integrity and love who's pursuing his amends and and trying to take responsibility for healing and sometimes just having to hand that over to God. It's the difference is, is it galactic, you know? Right. <laughs> and you know what? You could take the same conversation that we've been having about this. And instead of the pastor, it could be the church. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You absolutely. know, and it's like, so society says it's an absolute ruin. We know the kind of damage that it has done. We have participated in it. We've been impacted by it. So how do we then, because it is composed of people who are precious in the midst of all that destructiveness. And so how do then we, we, how do we re, reimagine and then in the sense of actually reestablishing it according to truth, which is the relationship of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as an expression of that rather than structure and power. And so, you know, I understand the title of your, your podcast. I don't believe it, but I understand it. <laughs> because, I love it. Be That's good. Be because this conversation is exactly what you want church to be. Right. Authentic, open, whole, kind, considerate, not power-centered. And that's the, that's the damage of language, right? We don't know how to talk about church as a living organism and body of, and community of people. We only know how to talk about it in terms of place and structure. So how, how do we be even in place and structure and not of it? That is, how do we be church inside the system of religious structures? Because none of those are permanent or eternal. Well, and it's, it strikes me that um, I, I was talking about this with my wife just a couple of days ago, and um, she had questions about the, you know, the title of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still unresolved about it, but I'm like, okay, well, it's this. And it's, I said, you know what? But you know, what struck me was this. John and I have been participants in things over the years that we would have very much considered to be church. And, and then someone comes along and goes, ah, what? that's not church. And so almost there's a tongue in cheek kind of like, hey, you know, we've almost latched on to this as kind of like how I've embraced my own label as heretic because it's been hurled at me enough times. I'm like, fine, if that's what you want to call me, then fine, I'm a heretic. Yeah. I'll, I'll take that word back. But this idea of, of, of what is the church, you know, the ecclesia, the called out, right? The whole, and that we've taken that precious um, witness to the resurrection of Jesus, the thing that is, is honestly, it's the only thing that we have to offer the world as proof that Jesus is anything. And we've then turned it into something. I think that a lot of times Jesus himself wouldn't recognize um, structures and hierarchy and pecking orders and authority and whatever, all that stuff is and turn it into an instrument of, of violence and hate and all kinds of exclusion. So part of me, why I stay inside of it is I'm taking it back, man. Like, like what we imagine church can be, has got to be pursued by somebody, right? Right. So I mean, we're all taking it back. And, and you don't have to engage with a structure in order to take it back. I mean, absolutely. Church, church is independent of system and structure. It's, it's a living, breathing woman and um, whom Jesus is in love with, right? And so, and so, you know, one of the conversations I've been having recently with Gary Grant, um, he and his wife are in Australia and, and, you know, he did a lot of church missions kinds of things, burned out completely. And Trinity has kindly 
reorienting him to the to a different way of being, right? And so we were talking about the difference between contract and covenant. And this applies to the pastor, the book, right? That um, a, a lot of our vitriol in the world is because everything is contractual and uh, it's legal. And so in any legal contract, you have a stipulation of what the roles are and what the expectations are and what you need to do to perform. And then there's this section of remedies, which are always the, the, the violence part of the, of the contract. You know, what we will do to you if you fail to live up to the expectations. And a lot of people, even in marriage, they see marriage as a contract. And, um, where all of these things were, uh, to be covenant, even families structure themselves according to contract. And in a, in a covenant, and this is Gary, this is so beautiful. He says, in a covenant, the other is never the enemy. What is the enemy is everything that becomes a barrier or an inhibition to relational intimacy. Wow. Right? Say that again, man. Say that again. So in a covenant, the enemy is anything, whether it's in you or it's in me or it's in structure or it's in society or it's in addiction or it's in mental illness. It is anything that is an inhibitor or restricts relational intimacy, right? That's the enemy. And so when you, when you covenant together as going into marriage, the covenant is, I will never make you the enemy. But together, we will make the enemy anything that is an inhibitor or restrictor of relational intimacy. And we're going to go after that together, right? Even in a parental situation, one party takes that role until the child grows up into face-to-face where then, then they, they engage in the covenant, right? But initially, it's the, the parent who says, I'm never going to make you the enemy. I'm going to make anything that is an inhibitor to our relational intimacy, right? Which to me just, just totally changes the landscape. And, and so in the pastor, you could try to deal with this as a contractual thing. And, and we get all mad because he didn't live up to what he was supposed to do as a pastor and all the legal contractual definitions of performance. And, and because of that, because contract is greater to us, because the law written on stone is, creates a greater degree of certainty than law, the law written on human hearts, right? On flesh. Then, then we always tend to create our model of relationship around the contract. And, and that's what's the basis of our vitriol on our need for vengeance, because we got disappointed. We got hurt. We got Right. And and expectations, expectations become laws that bite you in the ass. Yeah. Yeah. Every time. And they're every one of them becomes a disappointment. Right. So the expectations placed on us by others, the expectations we place on others, 100 percent, you bring up vengeance, uh, which leads me to my my other question about Max. So what is it about Max that so thoroughly pisses off the pastor? that he becomes the focal point of all of his rage, all of his, everything is now focused in on, on the scapegoat, Max, he's the guy. So I'm just curious, what is it that, that, that you feel like that, that pulls out of the pastor that angers him so much? It's a great question. You know, I mean, part of it is, although Max, okay, I want to tell people a secret too. Okay. Max has, is mute and has one hand. Google Maximus the Confessor. Okay, so then I was hoping that I was hoping that was intentional, but, but it was in, it was intentional, and the same thing happened to him. So he just wouldn't leave. <laughs> uh, relentless, relentless love that follows you da- around like a puppy uh, can be very triggering, and we've discovered this even in working with people with addictions. Aside from their own resentments and grandiosity, the other thing that can trigger relapse is the Holy Spirit and love. (laughs) Because 
when love comes close and, and, and you have protected yourself with a hedge of thorns and then it comes inside that you just want to run. And, and, and where will you run from his presence? If you make your bed in Sheol, he's there. And I think Max expresses that a little bit. So when, when Kim caught me in adultery, right, my wife, back in 94, and the first person that I needed to talk to about it other than her was her dad, who lived with us, right? His, his name is Willard, and he lived with us for 17 years. We lived with him for 17 years in a shared house, and he died on his 84th birthday in 2002, surrounded by balloons and kids. And, and uh, we all called him Willie. The Willie in the shack is Kim's dad. And, and so I, here's what I wanted him to do. I wanted him to beat the hell out of me. Right? In, in part, because I know to some degree, because of my survival skills with my own dad, how, how to survive that. I know how to deal with that. I have, I have, survival mechanisms that can deal with a with with a fist or the open hand yeah in the, in this but he never once over the next years never once raised his voice or or harmed me and i have no defenses other than to run that's the and i had made the decision that i'd hit the bottom and i wasn't going to run from this for the first time in my life i wasn't going to move somewhere else right i wasn't going to start over again for the many many time and um but i had no resistance to love i know i i just watched my choices break his heart and leak down his face and um, and so here you've got, you know, Max, who represents that kind of consistent presence of love. And, and nobody, other than to run, nobody has a resistance to that. Because in the face of everything that's not true, which is why you've done what you've done, that which is really present and true is an absolute violation of everything that you consider to be your your safety and your survival and yet it's what your heart absolutely longs for at the same time and it and and so i a lot of people they get to that edge where they can maybe take the risk of that kind of love and it's so terrifying that that their reaction to it is violent, you know, and, and in a sense, it's a test. We had a, um, we had a friend, a young woman at the time was an alcoholic and she would do this test with us all the time. She had been abused as a kid. She was a secret alcoholic and, um, and, and, and then, but she was so hungry for the love that we were talking about at the church we were in at the time, Fresh Wind. And so she would come to home group. She was in our home group. And no matter what she confessed or, or thought or did or whatever, the, the love was consistent. But she had to test the limits of it. So she would, she would come to home group really drunk sometimes. And I'm like, so what is that about? And she just, I'm, I'm testing the limits of, of love. And then it was finally when she had an encounter with Christ and saw his grief for her in the same way that Paul saw his father-in-law's, the grief, it actually cracked through her cravings and, and she had a profound healing. And, uh, but it, that was the thing is it didn't matter whether she came drunk or not. It didn't matter whether she tested the love. What mattered is that she, she didn't run, right? Or maybe she'd run. But only till next week, <laughs> you know, <laughs> until until the love pur purged this stuff out. And um, so, yeah, there's a lot behind that Max character in in our real lives, isn't there? So, and, and the pursuit of the way love pursues us, the Hound of Heaven, right? 
Right, right, for sure. My 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 oldest is now uh, 21. She'll be 22 in August. When she was about 16 or 17, she really started pushing my buttons, right? <laughs> you know, that teenager. Go figure. And uh, yeah, and uh, I became that parent. I became the dominating, you will you live under my roof, you obey my rules, you do what I say. And we spent about two years in that world. You know, at the end of every time I'd say, you know, but I love you and I'm doing this from love. <laughs> and uh, she turned 18 and I came to a, a huge awakening that what I was doing wasn't love. There was no love in what I was doing. And so I had to come to her and apologize and say, you know, if I had just treated you like a human being at minimum, right? And listen to you, why you were angry, why you were upset with me, as opposed to reacting every step of the way. A lot of this would have been so much better. And then what do you do? You have to spend the next, I don't know how many years fixing it, right? Because uh, now it's the, it's that shame of, that you built inside of you that you are actually you're deep down you are a horrible person you you were a horrible father and I see that in the pastor you know I see that in it's all been internalized all of his grief and his shame so what's what's the way out so the beautiful thing about the pastor is that there is no possibility he can fix it. <laughs> That's, you know, he is not under the illusion that now that he is changed, he can go back and fix things. You know, the, the, the real journey is an inward one. And then it's about learning how to just trust that activity as it, as it expresses itself into the world. And it's not about, you know, well, well let me give you an example. We have our, we have six kids and our 13th and 14th grandchildren are, on the way, right? And uh, two of our kids haven't produced any children yet. One's not married and one just got married. So, you know, uh, but here, here is a surprise for me. My growth as a human being and my ability to be present now because of the work that I've done over the last years has increased so much my capacity to love my grandchildren well. I'm so much better a grandfather than I ever was a dad. And I am watching the love I have for my grandchildren heal, ripple in and heal the deficits that I inflicted on my children. So I... It's not me trying to fix it by loving my grandchildren well. It's me doing the work so that I love well, period, and then trust the ripples as they've rippled out in, in, in ways that I could not have foreseen or imagined. Trust the ripples. That's one of my favorite Paul Young slogans because it's more than a slogan. You yeah. know, <laughs> he it? really lives it. I think if I can add to that, please. It would be, it would be a miscommunication of of this little novella if people read it and thought I need to just go off by myself and do all this work, internal work, you know, like because he, right, he's in solitary, he's in, but the reality is even even the pastor has a healing team, and that's an enormous part of of my story and of Paul's story, um, that that our wives were part of our healing team. Our pastors were, uh, in my case, I had a, a, a really good medical doctor and, uh, and, um, a spiritual director <laughs> and, and it's, it's stuff I couldn't have done on a, in isolation. And, and even the pastor doesn't right. He, uh, the, the two women that come to him, uh, in the psych ward, are part of his healing because he ha he has to face stuff that he couldn't do by himself, and it's sort of like going back to what Paul said about even our our, our enemies, you know, our beloved enemy. What 
you know, the slap on one cheek, you turn the other cheek. It's like, what's Jesus up to there? Um, some people think he's just giving you a great strategy for shaming offenders. It's like, no, I, I, I think he's harnessing your external enemy to, to be an ally in dealing with your internal enemy. And because, you know, because of Paul's honesty with me, he can take me a long way in facing stuff I don't want to look at, even really subtly. <laughs> And, um, but, but there may be a few things I I need a hater that Paul would be unwilling to take the role of the hater. And I need the hater to go after some of that stuff inside. So even they become part of your healing team. But I just wanted to, 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 to emphasize what, you know, what the inner work Paul is talking about. We didn't do it on our own. That's absolutely right. When I, I always find it shocking that either one of you guys have detractors, I, I, I'm truly, I'm truly mystified by that. Um, it just goes to show that people will will hate on whatever. Um, I want to share something with you both while I have you here because um, I just want to, and I have you both here. So and I'll see if I can get through it without sobbing like a little baby. But I don't. So please, yeah. ripples, Paul. Why? Ripples. <laughs> I'm trust. I, 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 I love that. I'm, I'm, t- I'm stealing that. By the way, yep. I'll do that old preacher trick where you know, first time I'll attribute it to you, the second time I'll say I've, I've heard it said, the third time I'm saying I've always said. Um, <laughs> trust the ripples. Truth is not ours. You'll get credit for at least you'll get credit for one of those. Um, but as a pastor, you know, and I've been in various forms of ministry for a good chunk of my life now. Um, honestly, it's what I've chased and pursued most of my life and never achieved because I don't think I should have. <laughs> but here I am, I'm still in this pastoral role. But early on, you know, I, as a young man, I was pretty fundamentalist in my understanding of, of the Bible and God. And I was going through this process of questioning. Some of it was self-inflicted. Some of it was just stuff foisted upon me that caused me to ask questions. And so a lot of stuff was under re-examination, Right. Um, we can call that deconstruction if you want to, but mine was pretty catastrophic. It all kind of came crashing down. And in the midst of some of the rebuilding, um, my oldest daughter came to us and told us she was pregnant and she wasn't married. It's because of the process I was going through, and you, Brad, and you, Paul, play a humongous role in that, that I didn't do what I would have done five years ago. Prior to that, I would have, I would have probably turned my back, said, well, you know how I feel about that. I know how you, you know how you've shamed me now. I'm a pastor. I can't show my face in this church with this daughter who's pregnant out of wedlock. I can't do any of that. And so, you know, we're going to have to work this out, but there would have been a hell of a lot of shame heaped upon by me and felt by me. But what I have instead are two grandkids and a daughter who are still very much in my life, who live a couple miles away from me. Uh, I see my grandsons every, gosh, almost every day sometimes. I have a relationship with them simply because I made space for them. I created and I held space for for her and for her um, for her husband, who she would eventually get married. So that's not a question. That is simply a thank you, that that the work that you guys are doing results in actual change that actually affects people positively. And I have a four-year-old or a three-year-old and a six-year-old grandson in my life, largely because of the work that, that, I, that I participated in with y'all, whether you were aware of it or not. So that's just from me to you guys. Thank you for that. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. We will have more, please. Yes, more. That, that really that ministers to our hearts, you know? It's, Absolutely. It, it, it prevents me from doing a follow-up book where I repent <laughs> of, of all of this. I've I've actually got the title for the book in in case I need to write it at some point. The title is Deceived by Hope, How He Discovered Satan is More Loving Than God. (laughs) Nothing like going back to your roots, you know. Yeah, but because you encouraged us today, I'm going to hold off on that book for yet 24 more hours. Hold up. Yeah, yeah. please don't do that yet. Um, Sadly, it would be a bestseller. (laughs) <laughs> in certain circles that would be fire dude like yeah. oh my goodness man but um wow okay i don't even know how to follow up my own question i had one in my mind and it went out the door with uh with the title of your weird book so <laughs> uh, and what you were talking about is truly you know that little phrase was given to me at the beginning of last year trust the ripples which means yeah. you know don't make your decisions based on perceived outcomes right just right, participate right. in the grace of the day 
you know, allow the response you make to be the pebble that's dropped into the lake and then trust the ripples. And it's like God is so in the ripples. And, um, and that is, you, you do the work that's in front of you, and then you see this kind of, you know, the response that you've just given to us as, as just we get to see a glimpse of what the ripples were. And, you know, we, it's, it's like, wow, we got to participate in it. It's like, you know, one of my grandkids doing something for the first time and, you, and you've done 80% of it, but, but they're sure they did it, right? For sure. And, Absolutely. And it's, I mean, they're just like blown away that they have this kind of personal agency now. And, uh, and, and I feel that, you know, that's what, that's what it's like. A lot of this, it's like, ah, oh, no, no, you get to be the child, respond to what's in front of you and trust the ripples. Can you imagine the kid with the five loaves and two fish going home and like, look, what and, I did. look what Jesus and I did. We, 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 we teamed up. <laughs> This is like me writing a novel with Paul Young. <laughs> and, and the kid would just be like, we did it. And in fact, Jesus would do the same thing, right? Yes, that's right. Look what we, as participation matters. Yeah. And it is true. That would not have happened without that little boy. Yeah. Uh, Desmond Tutu said that. He said, for whatever, I, re- I memorized this. I got to see him once live. And he said, for whatever reason... Since mankind showed up on the scene, God does nothing in this world without a willing human partner. Ooh, bam. Yeah. And that's really yeah. true. It's really true because otherwise, like, it would, it's not even his nature to do otherwise. Because otherwise, uh, we'd have to accuse him of not making manna every day for all the starving people. Right. It's like, that's, no, right. that's not what I do. What I do is I partner with willing willing people uh, to mediate divine love into this world, to be my body. To be my hands and to be my feet, right? We, we had an amazing, man, really good conversation with Thomas Ord last night. Yeah. And um, I wanted to ask you about something that we talked about because it, 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 it all sort of begins to dovetail, you know? So the nature of God is, is love. We all know that. I think we all, we all resonate with that. And that love is an uncontrolling love. Um, so what, what Tom would say is that God doesn't intervene in the world. He's never removed his presence from the world. And so asking him to come and intervene is asking him to do something that we are either unwilling or unable to do. We, what the God, for God to intervene in whatever sense we think requires participation and cooperation from us to do it. I would wonder what y'all, what do y'all think about that as a kind of dovetail with what you were just talking about? Well, I think about that a lot. I wrote about it in A More Christ-Like God as well. Um, what people mean though, I want to hear, you know, I hear my mom's prayers that God would intervene and I don't correct her because what she means is would when we are God's partners, we, we also have a divine partner. So what she's asking for is divine participation. And, and I buy that he is, God is all in, in terms of participation, but what, what Ord is doing there. And also this is in Simone Vey is that he's using intervention as a technical word for violating human freedom or natural law. And it's, and I don't know if Tom and I are exactly on the same page in this, maybe, but I would, um, what Vey says is that the fact that God does not violate Human freedom or natural law does not mean he doesn't participate. What it means right. is that his participation is by love rather than by force, and that that love is about consent and participation through willing human partners, and that and that it's not even even a miracle isn't a violation of natural law if love is the highest natural law that permeates the cosmos. So he's both he and I teach that love as divine consent. Um, but, but, but the participation can include Jesus Christ as the human partner. The, the, it can include prayer. Prayer yeah. is oh, partnering, sure. right? And so, um, I, I see too many things that are outside the possibility of strictly human agency, but they always involve it. So, uh, Paul, does that seem right? Yep. Yeah. I'm I'm with you, and the greatest example would be Jesus Himself, right? Because that's an intervention, and uh, 
and it's an intervention. So it's, it again is the participation between his humanity and divine nature. And so, but, uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to, to think about that in technical terminology. It's another thing to experience in terms of the, the radical freedom of God's agency. Yeah. And, and, and so, you know, I, I don't want to limit it to our perception of the technique of it. Sure. You Amen. Know, because, Agreed. because there is so much mystery to the activity of God that, ah, you know, it's, yeah, I, I can see some people, you know, uh, using, using the teaching to, to despair of the efficacy of prayer, for example. And sure. I, I just don't believe that. I, I pray, Lord, have mercy, knowing that he does, and that somehow even that simple prayer, without respect to specific outcomes that I'm demanding, <laughs> works in this world. I, uh, one example I want to give you just very briefly I, I was going through a, one of the times when I was going through a very rough period. Um, I decided I was going to, all I was going to do is just pray, Lord have mercy. And I was going to pray for everybody who I work with, everybody who I love, everybody who I'm related to and all of that. And just, and, and that's all I could manage in prayer at the time. So it'd be Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on Eden. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on and I do my kids and then I do the people in my 12 step group. And then I do the people in ministry with, and then I went through my family and then, and so I'm praying for my, <laughs> I, ex, I expanded it, but I really believed he would have mercy. I guess that's where there was a bit of faith. And I prayed for my brother-in-law's ex-wife, her, her child that she had given up when she was a teenager for adoption and had never met. And I'm like, I'm going to start praying for that, put that kid in. And I didn't even know the kid's name. And I, I, I prayed, uh, you know, for about a month for that kid, Lord have mercy on that kid, who would now be like 18 or 20 years old, right? Within 30 days, without me saying anything to my ex-sister-in-law, they met each other for the first time in their lives and had an incredible encounter of, of mutual grace and and I'm like did my did my prayer have a part in that I I don't know I wasn't asking for that but I was asking for mercy and I I believe that that maybe maybe I offered half a sardine <laughs> um, to, toward a toward something but whatever no and it's interesting because we asked Tom about that specifically and you guys are closer than than I think you think um, and he does not dis- despair of prayer one tiny bit. No, he wrote a book on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I know he, I know I, I actually had the question because for me, I, I, that I was, you know, I had that question. Okay. Well then why bother? You know? And then I would ask that question more of people who are so deterministic in their view that they assume that everything's mapped out and planned out. And then well, why, then why bother at all? Um, so I'm wrestling with Tom. I told him that, that, uh, even the title of his book pissed me off. And so, um, <laughs> Which it one took me God, a little while God to get. Can't. Yeah, I'm like, what do you mean, God can't? <laughs> Shut up, man. T-? So I, I'm like, he's just not. Nah. And then I went to my next stage was, well, he's just being a provocateur. He just put a real, you know, oh, it's a you know, title. catchy yeah. title on there. And he's just, <laughs> he's going to walk me through how God actually really can. And, and then I'm like, nope, nope, that's not what he does. <laughs> so it, it, it was great because it challenged me. Um, like all, like all great books do, a Christ like God really really challenged me. The shack really challenged me, man. I had to get through some stuff there. It was, that was rough. Especially but believing I, God is love, right? That, I mean, that's, that's, the, a, that's a hard one, man. It's the big heresy. You know, what's interesting, you say that tongue in cheek, but yeah. I know, of course. You know, uh, not in the face yeah. of evil and pain. Because, because God is love abstractly, sure. Sure. I mean, I don't think there's a Christian on planet Earth who wouldn't say, of course God is love. And then follow it up with, the butts, the butts that come. So I was right. one of those. My yeah. God is love, but he's also just, and he's also holy, and he's also wrathful. He's also this, and he's, you know, before I began to see all of those things as expressions of love, I still had to wrestle. So, and then all of that is well and good, right? Until that God is love thing has got to have some effect on you, yourself, or on somebody you really don't like. Or or on someone you love deeply who it looks like God let them down because of what happened in their life, right? Like, how can right, we say right. God is love when a toddler drowns in grandpa's swimming pool? You know, like, 
that kind of thing. And I, I, I knew of a home group that was actually inside the house praying. Oh my while, Lord. While the kid out, out is outside drowning. And, and it's like, what do you, what do you mean? God is love. Then I, I think we better wrestle with that stuff. And I think the, I think we tried to, uh, in the pastor, I definitely think Paul pulled it off in, in the shack, which was my big hesitation too, is I, when I first read the book, I didn't know Paul yet. And I, I, I knew two things, but within a few chapters, one is this guy's been through something real. This is, but also this guy, <laughs> this guy better not pull off platitudes or I'm, I'm just going to be ra- And he didn't, he didn't, <laughs> and he I did. mean, by the grace no. of God, because of his experience, Paul doesn't need platitudes. He's, he knows. No, no. <laughs> Well, and that's one of those things that I, I've appreciated about both these. The pastor avoids those altogether. Um, there, man, the, the the platitudes and the the whatever, the one-off things that people always say. You know, the God's in control, and the Ugh. you know whatever, and or whatever we try to pass off as wisdom. A lot of times, there what, what's lacking so often is just some rawness and some willing to, willingness to just either say, "I just don't know," or. Or even to admit that this sucks. I grew up in part of my life in the Word of Faith movement. I'm sure Brad and y'all have spent some time around around that phenomenon. And to and to utter anything negative was always like, listen, you're, you know, you're you're, how would they put it? Um, anyway, essentially, don't say something negative. It's going to come back. You're going to put something negative out in the world. It's going to come back on you, which sounds very karmic to me. But um, that was the thing. Don't confess that. That's what they say. Don't confess that. Don't put that on me. Sound like uh, you know that guy in that. Adam said, don't put that on me, Ricky Bobby. Right. Um, <laughs> magic is power. <laughs> yeah. yeah, magic yeah, is, yeah. So this whole, you know, but it's anyway, so, but it's not love. What, what I really though, man, what I really appreciate about the, about um, the pastor in particular is there's, there's this sense of unresolvedness at the end. Yeah. Right. Um, like all good stories, I think there's no, and then everyone lived happily ever after, and there you go, boom. There's your there's your story, neat and tidy up in a bow. It leaves a lot of a lot of space, and so yeah, I wonder if you're if, the sequel, right? Like, right? <laughs> if we've understood the book, yeah. <laughs> then you you go live the sequel now. What would it mean to wake up? Right. Well, and <laughs> so I know you're inviting people to see themselves in this, right? Absolutely. Um, I think it was Richard Rohr's book, The Divine Dance, where he talks about the the icon, right? There's this famous Russian painting of of the Holy Spirit or of, of, the, of the Trinity. And then he posits and people have opined that at the bottom of this picture, there used to be a mirror. mirror. Yeah. And you were, you know, you were invited to see yourself as being drawn into this. And, and I wonder if that's just not what good storytelling does in general is draw you in invite you to see yourself in the characters yeah that's part of the power of fiction is that it creates more space than it uses so that you can hear for yourself yeah i uh as i was listening to the book the first time because i I didn't have the actual you know tangible book i was listening to it so uh, as it came to the end and i kind of expected an epilogue (laughs) i just thought that was going to be the next the next year the epilogue john would be this and uh I was, I, and when I listened to it again, uh, I was telling Nat, I was like, you know what? I mean, it, it, that's, that's exactly right. It, it, sh- it, it, sh- it shouldn't be there. Yep. Um, you, you, it, to resolve this in any way would demean the story, would, would lessen the story. And uh, was that intentional? It, it would, it would dehumanize the story. Yeah. And in fact, the, it, it, it's an open story. Our lives are an open story. You know, I, I came through, my mine is, I'm not done yet. I don't know how this ends. And, uh, but I know, you know, I've also seen, I've seen profoundly miraculous kind of deliverance in a life followed two years later by a horrific suicide, you know? And I'm like, but, but they met Jesus. And, and in fact, he, he did a miracle. And then he, it's like, it can, where do you go from there? Well, that's the question. Where, where do we go from there? And what I, what I've learned from Paul is, well, I'm going to live in the grace of today. And, uh, that's, or, or as the 12 steppers say, JFT just for today. Right. And, um, and then they, they do a closing greeting to each other. Someday, uh, have another 24. 
<laughs> and I'm like, yeah. okay, I'll try to have another that. three or four. But yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. But there's grace, there's grace, and there's not grace for what isn't yet. So right, there's only grace for what is. You don't get grace for things that don't exist. Right, and so that that I, I find within the pastor a sort of a universal sense of fracturing, you know, where we have, and Brad, we talked about this last week when we talked about sort of this existential reality we live in versus this, you know, sort of cosmic or eternal identity and how those things, if they don't jive, they create this fracturing of our personhood. Did you, would you attribute some of that to this pastor as he's kind of tried to push some of these things down and hide them and bury them and perform in a certain way that he's sort of broken himself on the inside? Oh, he's sure fractured. All right. Like most, like most, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and and at the heart of every institution are human beings who are fractured, and we can make the institution the problem, and try to resolve and rehabilitate the institution, but until the healing of the heart is happening, all, all we're doing is cosmetic, and and you know institutional structures left to their selves. I mean, they'll take on a power and become human trafficking organizations. That's what they do. And and most of what we call the church, a lot of, not most maybe, but a lot of what, what we call the church in terms of its objective institutional structured system is a human trafficking organization. Wow. And um, the book of Revelation. Wow, you're not wrong about that. Well, the book of Revelation calls it that. So Yeah, yeah right. Wow. So, the, I mean, in and the frustration too, and this is, I, you can see it when any addict, but especially let's say a pastor <laughs> is feeling the, the tension of a double life where there's an expectation to be perfect and mm-hmm. there's a reality that they're not. And, and to the degree that the pastor is, is a metaphor for the church, you know, here's the irony. We want the church to be a place where sinners are welcomed instead of condemned. So then the sinners show up and we condemn it for have, being a <laughs> sinful place. You know, like, right. well, what did you expect? Yeah. What, right. do, you, what do we want? Yeah. Do we want yeah. it to be a welcome place for sinners? Then, then don't condemn it for being a sinner. Right. Right. And so right. We, would do, we could do that with a pastor, right. but also with the collective. And I'm not talking now institution. I'm talking the real people who disappoint me yeah. and I, I want to tear my hair out. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'm like, hang on a second. Like who, who else did I think would come if my message is on? Yeah, okay. If my message is wrong, I'll get all the right people in my opinion. But if I, <laughs> but, but if my message looks anything like the gospel of Jesus Christ, then I am gonna. I am in for a one major dis, <laughs> like a Serious. lot of disappointment because that's right. the sinners will show up and they don't get clean by walking in my door. Right. And when was it my door anyway? <laughs> so <laughs> and, and the yeah. heat that their experience is going to start to melt my facade, right? Yeah. And yeah, up yeah. to the surface will come the fact that I'm one too. You know. Yeah. And it's like ah, oh, yeah, exactly. And somebody has said that the pastor in their mind represented American Christianity, <laughs> mm. <laughs> which is, you know, Western. We didn't see that. see that ahead of time, did we, Paul? No, it we came didn't. in after the fact. We're like, actually, yeah. 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 And, and that means yeah. there's hope for it. I, I kind of don't believe that, but like, I do believe that. <laughs> as, long as, as long as there are people involved, there's hope. Yeah. 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 <laughs> wow. Man, that's a. That's awesome stuff. I, 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 I can see that. I can see that connection for sure. Uh, one of the things I try to get my, uh, my parishioners, you know, the handful that are sticking around, um, to see is that what we have tended to universalize as the church is a tiny little smidgen of a speck of the, of, of Christendom. Right. And so we have this tendency to get so inwardly focused that we, we think that what we are experiencing represents the width and breadth of the testimony of the church worldwide. And um, so I'm trying to, you know, at the very least say, listen, not everyone sees things the same way. You know, I love what I love about um, even something like, say, the creeds that we recite. You know, what I love, I say this all the time, but what I love about, it, about the creed is I love what's left out as much as what's put in. Because it leaves so much space to say, well, okay, fine. We don't have to, those things you think are really important and were worth fracturing a church over weren't even part of this, 
right? We've made mountains of molehills and we have to find this common ground. And so um, that's part of what I think that something like the work that you guys are doing can help us to do is to heal, to bring a, you know, a more, a more broad sense of what church can be and what Christian life can be, right? That's whole and holistic, um, that doesn't force people into molds and, and compel them to perform. Yeah. So. It's, it's kind of like, you know, growing up in the conservative uh, fundamentalist world like we did. I think we share a lot in common um, where you have, you know, God pouring out his wrath on his son kind of theology. And, and then you find out that there are 350 million Orthodox who are required not to believe that. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah, right? Uh, yeah. It's yeah. like, oh, you know, we we don't have the corner on this, eh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Eh? Eh? Well, it's like I was raised in, you know, it's like Brad was, you know, dispensational, you totally. know, fundamentalist. So I'm yeah. waiting for the rapture, man. Yeah. I'm scared to death that I'm going to miss it, you know? And then I, you know, I get involved with people who are Methodists and they're like, well, what's that? I'm like, you don't know about the rapture? Oh, dude, you're toast. You're going to get left behind, you know? And so there's entire mainline denominations of churches that don't believe any of the stuff that we would espouse as sort of the, whatever, the non-denominational Christians we were that just look at us askance. Like, we're just, like, uh, it just sounds like gobbledygook, you know? So um, take a step back from that, right? Yeah. When I was in Bible school, I, I, I was part of a drama group that toured around, you know, on behalf of the school and everything else, but it was really a creative group. There's a guy named Clyde Walker, who was just a fantastic writer. And he just helped, helped write all these little beautiful vignettes. But one of them was, you know, a church meeting that only had two members left in it. And, and they're meeting because one of them is going to kick the other one out. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they they got down to such iotas of differences in doctrine that you know yeah. finally they weren't even allowed to have a relationship with each other so it's like the ultimate end of the craziness that we get involved with well <laughs> almost ultimate because i have to i have to excommunicate myself sometimes well, right is, right isn't isn't the <laughs> excommunication of the last other person self-excommunication isn't that the yeah, definition that's of right. that's... and then the establishing of a new denomination well, yeah. <laughs> what happens is this woman shows up in the middle of their conversation and invites them to all the outcasts that they, they had thrown oh out. no and we're all getting together and loving each other <laughs> <laughs> that's great i love it man. i have a friend online and that's what she she actually jokingly said she was going to start her own denomination it would be a denomination of one person though <laughs> yeah they, they would have no structure no one else would be invited or allowed to join it would just be her it's called and, uh, it's called satan <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> like a church <laughs> of one man <laughs> hey hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am my own pope. I mean, that is the temptation, even of Protestantism, isn't it? It's, totally, <laughs> well, isn't it? Yeah, I yeah. mean, that's a good, that's a good, interesting thing to talk about. I mean, that that was, yeah, because of because of the the churches that I grew up in. Brad, did you grow up in like non denominational churches as well? No, I, I was in a, a in a Baptist denomination, so it wasn't really our own pope. But we were, <laughs> we were. Like in my world, brother, in fact, I am, I still am non-denominational. Um, but in, in my world, man, there's no accountability. I mean, I can, yeah, there's guys out there preaching stuff that'll make your hair stand on end. And, you know, as long as they got a few people in the, in the seats who will cheer and say, amen, then they can, man, go for I've it. I've never seen an actual true non-denominational church. You know, they're always interested in the fives, the tens and the twenties. Uh <laughs> <laughs> I prefer the hundreds, but if you're making donations today, yeah, yeah the word, give me those, give me those big denominations. Thousands please. are coming forward, brother. Wow. Yeah. Paul's dropping, Paul's dropping bombs, man. I love it. Denominations. All right. So now I'm, I'm, I'm taking that one as well. So good. I had a whole, I, I'm going to write a book based on the stuff that I steal from you today. Paul. It. That's great. I'm at it. Oh, it's beautiful, man. Oh, we've kept you for an hour and 13 minutes, man, and I would keep you for two more, but I know y'all probably have things to do. Can I ask you one more question before we let you go and maybe leave one for John, too, because I I just sometimes get going. But um, I always want to know, and I keep forgetting to ask people, what, 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 what kind of books are you reading now? What kind of stuff are you, are you digging into? Um, 
who's somebody you would recommend? So we're going to do a study this later this year on McDonald's unspoken sermons. And so I would, oh, I, I love would, George. I would always recommend McDonald, but, um, probably the easiest version is the, uh, Roland Hine edited version. It doesn't have all the unspoken sermons in it, but it's, it's easier to grasp. Uh, the English of it has been kind of, um, transliterated, which is helpful. But that's, that's definitely one. Um, I've always yeah, got a, George is great. I've always got a stack going in the background. No, I, I do too. You just can't see it behind me. I've got, in fact, I've got McDonald and Moulton inspector somewhere. And, you know, so. <laughs> well, for doing book recommends. Yes, for sure. A more Christ like God. No, I'm just kidding. No, uh, I would. You know, but it is self-serving a little bit. Um, the, the book that has had most on, impact on me in my life next to the four gospels, uh, Simone Ve, W E I L, Awaiting God. There's another one called Waiting for God, but Awaiting God is my translation that combines two of her books. So Simone Vey, Awaiting God, uh, saved my life. She was part of my healing team. One word, Awaiting or yeah, uh, one Awaiting word. God? Okay, cool, cool. And that's actually, for all the terrible audiobooks that are out there, um, the audiobook of that one's really good too. I got a, a, a female narrator who is fantastic because it's Simone yeah, Vey's yeah. journals, so... Wow, yeah. that's awesome! That's going on my it's going on my Amazon list here pretty quick. You guys have uh, blown my minds. Um, I mean, my mind, our minds. Yes, both of them. Yeah, I, I just I am nothing but grateful that you guys are willing to come on and talk with us and um, share with us. And I have nothing but love for both of you guys. Uh, nothing but respect for both of you guys. And uh, what both of your guys' books have done for me is unmeasurable. And I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm speechless. <laughs> Same thing. We, we, uh, we, we love you guys. We appreciate uh, the work that you do. Um, if you're listening and you want to you wanna experience some life-changing stuff, if you haven't read The Shack by now, by the way, come on, man. Right? Come on, come on. man. Get off, come on. Get off the schneid. Get, come on. I guarantee you the best thing about having a huge bestseller like that is you can probably find it in your local thrift store somewhere. I bet yeah, you. Absolutely. You know, it's like. Go ask a Baptist person. They'll sneak it out the back door. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got to say, though, the newest edition has an incredible story in the afterword. Yeah. Oh, several no. stories, right? Yeah. Uh, about Paul okay. and our experience, but Paul and I experienced with a family who had lost a daughter to suicide. Oh, wow. Who, okay. The encounter we had on the movie set, and that's a whole other story, but oh, I think see, that's in the latest it's, edition. It's in, it's in the. The movie, it has a movie cover on it. Gotcha, gotcha. In that version. See, we didn't even get to talk about that experience. But that, we left some oh meat on the bone for, for next time, man. <laughs> um, but the, uh, yeah, if you haven't read The Shack, obviously do it. If you haven't read A More Christ-like God, do it. Um, I literally just got um, A More Christ-like um, Way in the mail a couple of days ago when I'm, I'm, I'm fixing to dive into that. But A More Christ-like Word drops, what, this summer? Is that right, Brad? Yeah. So that's exciting. All kinds of good stuff. You guys are all over social media, you, you know, conferences and things that you do. So, I mean, you can't do much better than these two guys for, uh, for, uh, just quality, loving, gracious presentations of the gospel stuff that will revolutionize your mind and your heart. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah. Thanks for, for giving any excuse somebody gives me to hang around with Bradley. I'm, I mean, yeah, right. right? The, ex right. the excuse Me too. we didn't even need. <laughs> right. <laughs> but we will take advantage of it every time. Every time. Uh, so much 100%. fun. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to oh, go ahead. And... Oh, they're dropping the oh. Spanish version of the pastor. Oh, they are. Yep. Oh, it, El Pastor. Oh, the pastor. It's nice. called the, Senor. no, it's called the signal. Yep. No, the sign. Oh, the sign. sign. Oh, El Señor? <laughs> or is that yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's right. Okay. I'm a, I, 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 I learned a little Spanish back in the day, so that's awesome. I'm going to have to Sweet. check it out. Yeah, um, we're excited about that. They're excited so, about that. Actually, yeah, they're more yeah. excited than we are. <laughs> <laughs> man. <is> fantastic. <laughs> that is beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful, good stuff, man. All right. We love you guys. Love you, too. Love you back. Um, look forward to talking to you soon. Hang out for a second. Thank you for listening to This Is Not Church. Be sure to rate and review the podcast on your platform of choice. If you would like to partner with us, visit patreon.com slash this is not church, where you will receive exclusive content such as early access to episodes, videos of upcoming episodes, and live Q&A sessions. 
Be sure to check out our Facebook group or follow us on Twitter and Instagram. All the links are in the show notes. We'll be back soon with another episode.